Testing 910. There, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> now, can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. I won't have to talk very loud then. Revelation 2, beginning in verse 12. But let's have prayer before we get started here. And Earl, would you lead us today, sir? Amen. And would you take our offering, sir? What do you think of the decoration? Boy, didn't they do a good job? Barbara and her crew did that. Barbara and who? I just bought a bike. <laughs> did you help too, Cindy? I was here. Yeah? But I, I didn't do it. Well, thank you, all of you who helped. How wonderful. It's beautiful. The lobby, the fellowship hall. Everything so uh, beautifully decorated. Today we're going to be taking a look at the church in uh, Pergamos or Pergamum. And uh, it's verses 12 through 17 of chapter 2. Before we get started, does anybody have a specific prayer request? Okay, so there's been a death in that church. And uh, be sure and pray for Miss Faye Carney. I think we need to be sure and remember her. She's probably recuperating, but it's going to take a while because she had quite a, a bad fall. Anybody have any recent report? Is she up and around? You did? Okay. She went to her son's house for Thanksgiving? Okay. Well, keep praying for faith. Yes? All right, another death. Another death. Anybody else? Yes? Okay. She's on a trip. All right. Yes? another death. Tom and Sarah are in Georgia. Pray for their safe trip home. Anybody else? Okay. How's uh, Ken's wife? Uh, Marion, yeah, pray for Marion. Marion Jones. <clears throat> yes. I don't know. I, anybody got a report on Marion Jones? Yeah, maybe the, they may come in later. They may, they may show up. Yeah, Oscar and Roberta that had a really serious, some really serious disease, really serious illness. So, um, all right. Good morning, Elaine. Anybody else? Um, Lou, would you lead us in prayer for these requests? Amen. 
Amen. Thank you, Lou. The word Pergamos in Revelation 2 and verse 12, or Pergamum, as it's written in your King James Version, means citadel, C-I-T-A-D-E-L, citadel, or a burg. Um, what does it, what does that mean to you? What, what is the word citadel? I mean, when we think of that, what, what do we think of a, a citadel? Anybody have any comment on that? What is a citadel? Uh, military, okay, Kim. A what? A bird. <laughs> a bird. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Citadel. Citadel. Yes. What do you think of Barbara? So it's like high up. Something that's high up. Right. Um, a lot of, a lot of military towers. schools are considered. A lot of military schools are considered citadels. That's true. That's true. Um, to me, I guess, I was thinking of. Um, a castle with a moat, a, a place that's kind of impregnable, a citadel, something that is hard to conquer with maybe walls. Of, uh, anyway, the word per Pergamum or Pergamus means citadel. And I think there is, if you look at historically what the city uh, was like, it was like that. It was an impregnable uh, major uh, citadel, major fortress um, in that area. Now, uh, how many of you still don't have maps of the area? Does anybody not have their map with you today? Because I want to show you something about Pergamos on the map. All right? All right, back here we need maps. Anybody else? Raise your hand uh, up high if you need uh, maps. All right? And as soon as you get your map out, look for Mycia. Look for Mycia, M-Y-S-I-A, on the map. Does everybody see it? It's the name of an area uh, like Bithynia, like um, Pamphylia, like Galatia. Uh, you'll see Mycia. And on Mycia, your new map, Barb? You need map, Tracy. On the, on the map, you see Pergamum. Pergamum. You remember we studied Ephesus. See Ephesus on the coast, and you see uh, Smyrna, just above Ephesus, and then above Smyrna, you find a Pergamum. Everybody see it? Everybody see it? Now, Pergamum or Pergamus was the capital city of Mycia. It was, at first, just a very wealthy kingdom ruled over by a despot. And he expanded his kingdom until he ruled that whole area. And there were people living there who had moved from France. Now, the French originally were called Gauls, G-A-U-L-S. If you've studied history, you've heard of the Gauls. Well, these were French people who were living in that area. He took them all out and moved them over to Galatia. And you'll see Galatia on your map. And so that was inhabited mainly by those people that he moved out. And that's where Paul started the churches in Derby and Lystra and Iconium was in Galatia. But this king who ruled out of this kingdom... Um, called Pergamos, or Citadel, expanded that kingdom until it became the major city of Mycia and of that area. He also established a library. And the library that he established was only second to the one in Alexandria. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the library in Alexandria, Egypt, which was the major, most uh, important, most expansive library in that day. So this library in Pergamum was only second to it. And Mark Antony, when the Romans conquered, 
that area, Mark Antony gave that library as a gift to Cleopatra and <laughs> eventually moved it from Pergamos to Alexandria and expanded the library there in Alexandria. Now, in Pergamos, they had three gods. Zeus, anybody ever heard of Zeus? And Athena, who was the goddess of that area, and Caesar, Augustus, because the Caesars wanted people to think they were divine. And so they had three gods, Zeus, Athena, and Caesar. And they had their temples on an Acropolis. The Acropolis, you remember, is in Athens, and that's where Paul, Paul preached on Mars Hill. But in Pergamon, they also had a 1,000-foot high mountain, and they had these temples to Zeus and Athena and Caesar on the top of this 1,000-foot high Acropolis. And outside the city, they had um, all kinds of medicinal uh, kind of, you call them, I guess, in hospitals or clinics for healing uh, that these gods would, uh, would give to people. Now, it was a stronghold then of anti-Christian doctrine. A stronghold of anti-Christian doctrine. Now, can you think of any cities in the world today that would be strongholds of anti-Christian doctrine? Rome. Well, okay. Anti-Christian? There's a Vatican in Rome. <laughs> it's supposed to be Christian. I don't know, but I don't know. Will you call it Christian or not? Anyway, what else? Any other cities? What? Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Well, I laughed, but I probably shouldn't have. What else? Any other? Yes, Kim? Oh, okay. What about Baghdad? Mecca. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What about uh, in Afghanistan? Tehran. What about Pakistan? These anti I mean, you, you could actually give your life up in some of those areas if you claim to be a Christian. They would just take you out and shoot you. So now, let me ask you this question. How would you like to be called of God to be a missionary to plant a church in Tehran or Baghdad? Would you be scared? Would you be fearful? Now, the reason I said that is because this church that we're studying in verse 12 through 17 of chapter 2 today, that was a stronghold of anti-Christian doctrine. How did that church get planted there? Somebody had to take the gospel into that fierce opposition area and carve out souls and get them together and start a church. Who do you suppose that was? I think it was John. Why wouldn't it have been? John was the pastor in the church in Ephesus before he was exiled to Patmos, and he probably started the churches that we're looking at in these seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and chapter 3. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, all of those churches probably were started by the Apostle John. Now, if he preached there and started the church there in Pergamos, how do you think he would feel about that church? He would feel very personal about it, as we'll see as we study the lesson. Now, that church was so opposed, that church was so uh, against, they were so, Pergamos was so against that church that was started in its city that actually in verse 13 you read, Antipas, my faithful martyr, See what it says? 
Antipas, my faithful martyr, was slain among you. Now, whether or not Antipas was the pastor that succeeded John in that city, we don't know, but it certainly is possible that he was the pastor of that church, one of the leaders in the church, and they took him out and killed him uh, in uh, that city, in that city. Now, how does Jesus greet this church in verse 12? Remember, in each of the seven churches, we find Jesus greeting these churches. In Ephesus, we find he greeted them as the one who holds the seven stars in his hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. In, in Smyrna, we find that he greeted them as the one who is the first and the last and which was dead and is alive. Now, in Pergamos, how does he greet this church as the one who what? Has a sharp, two-edged sword. He is the one that has the sword, the sharp sword, with two edges. Now, I want you to turn to Psalm 149, please, in your Bibles. And let's see if we can find out some more about this sharp sword with two edges. Psalm 149. You remember in verse 16 of chapter 2, it says the sharp sword with two edges came from where? Out of Jesus' mouth. That's right. The sharp sword with two edges came out of Jesus' mouth. Now look at Psalm 149. Verse 5 says, Let the saints... Be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their breads. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. That's talking about the saints. And usually when the Old Testament refers to the saints, it's referring to God's chosen people, the Jews. So let's just read it that way. Let the Jews be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hands. To what? Execute vengeance upon the heathen, the Gentiles, and punishments. Keep those two words in mind. Vengeance and punishment. I underline them in my Bible. The two-edged sword was the purpose of vengeance and punishment to bind kings with chains, nobles with fetters of iron, to act upon them judgment. This honor have the saints. Praise you the Lord. So, Underline vengeance, underline punishments, underline judgments. All of these words connected to the two-edged sword that proceeds out of Jesus' mouth. So the question is this. Was this church in Pergamos, was this church in Pergamos in for some vengeance, some punishment, some judgment? Sandy? Revelation 19.13. All right. Sandy has found a reference to a two-edged sword in Revelation 19.13. You want to turn there, please? Revelation 19.13. Read it, Sandy. What? 19.15. Go ahead, Sandy. Read it. Right. So again, the sharp sword, Sandy, uh, you would agree, has to do with punishment, with vengeance, with judgment. And so the question I'm asking is, was this church facing Christ's judgment, punishment, and vengeance? Well, we're going to be looking for that. Let's start with the commendation that he gives to this church. Remember, in each of the seven churches, in almost all of them, Jesus commends or compliments, or encourages, or points out the good, the good things that was happening in these churches. So in verse number 13, let's see first of all his commendation. How does he commend, what does he commend in the church in Pergamos? Number one, he what? Knows their works. Now the works we talked about before, he knows what they're doing. He knows what they're doing. 
What are you doing in the church in Pergamos? I know, Jesus says, I know what you are doing. And whether that was good or bad, he knows their works. And the word is plural, so it's more than one thing that they were doing. All right, what's the second thing that he knows? He knows where they're dwelling. Now, where do you dwell? I dwell in Laurel on what was a pig farm. <laughs> it's not a pig farm anymore because the pig is no more. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I really thought that once the pig was gone, the smell would be gone. This morning I got up and walked out the door and I said, Hold oh, me. The smell is still here. But it's more of a goat and chicken smell now than it was a pig smell. But anyway, anyway, getting back to the point, where do you dwell? All right. So I'm calling this their position, where they sat, where their position was. Their position was probably a kind of a dangerous one because the permanent residence of the church in Pergamos, according to verse 13, was where whose seat was, where Satan's seat was. Satan had a seat, a dwelling place in Pergamos. He dwelt there. He was comfortable there. He sat there on a throne there in Pergamos, and this church must have been very close to that place where Satan was dwelling. Boy, what a scary thing that is. What's the third thing Jesus commends? He says, I know your works. I know where you dwell. And what else does he know? I know that you have and are, I know that you have and are holding fast my name. My name. The name of Jesus. The name of Christ. The name of Messiah. The church was not embarrassed, was not shy about proclaiming the name of Jesus. Now hold us forth my name. And then the last, what else did he know? I know that you have not denied my faith. You have not denied my faith. So the church had taken a stand. Even though they were close to where Satan was, they took a stand for Jesus. They took a stand for the faith. They took a stand for good works. Are these things commendable? Yes, they are. Now, First Baptist Church of Seaford, Delaware. Can Jesus commend those things about us? Does he know our works? Yes, he does. Does he know that we're holding fast? Yes, he does. Does he know that we're proclaiming the name of Jesus? Yes, he does. Does he know that we have not denied his faith? Yes, he does. I think one of the things that's commendable about First Baptist Church is we have held to those things just as well as this church in Pergamon. Now remember, remember as we're studying these churches, these seven churches were selected by Jesus Christ to represent all churches of all times in all history. Why would he choose just those seven when there were many, many other churches already started by the Apostle Paul? There was Derby, there was Lystra, there was Iconium, there was Antioch, there was, there was Thessalonica, there was Berea, there was Corinth, there was even Rome. All these other churches have been started, but Jesus chose only these seven. Why those seven? Because I believe they were specifically chosen because they were supposed to rent all churches of all times throughout all history. So there is a Pergamon church today. There is a Smyrna church today. <coughs> there is an Ephesus church today. And a Thyatira, and a Sardis, and a Philadelphia, and a Laodicea. And we'll find all those churches, probably most of them in our area. <laughs> and our church will be one of them. All right, now, let's talk about the condemnation beginning in verse 13. The condemnation was that Satan, number one, was sitting 
nearby the church. I know where you're dwelling, close to where Satan's seat is. I know you're dwelling awfully close to where Satan is sitting. How close to the, should the church be to where Satan's sitting? <laughs> I hope we're not close to where Satan's sitting. What would be the application of that? Maybe the church was too close to where, where Satan was sitting. In other words, the things of the devil, the things of the devil should be a long ways from the position of the church. But you know there are churches that like to get right close to that line. Say there's a line here, and on this side are the things of God, and on this side are the things of the devil. There are some churches that like to get real close to that line. Oh, they won't go over it, but they like to get real close to it. Should a church get close to the line, or what? Get farther away from the line. I say we ought to be as far away from the line as we can be. We need to be more right, maybe right, 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 to the right, <laughs> than to be close to the line. So the first thing that he condemns is how close they were to that line. The first thing that he condemns is how close they were to that line. Now, verse 14, what's another thing he condemns in the church of Pergamos? I have a few things against thee, because you what? You have somebody there, and notice the word them. And in my Bible, I underline the word them. Them takes place in that verse, them in verse 15, and them in verse 16. Underline them, them, them. You have them that what? I have a few things against you. You have them that what? Hold the doctrine of Balaam. All right, now, write down. Numbers 22, 23, and 24. The book of Numbers, chapter 22, 23, and 24. And instead of going back and going all through those verses, let me just give you a synopsis. The children of Israel came out of Egypt, came through the wilderness, and came to the borders of the land of Moab. Moab, you know the Moabites? The Ammonites and the Moabites, they were descendants of Lot. And so they came to the, or the border of Moab. And the king of Moab was a guy named Balak, B-A-L-A-K, Balak. And Balak saw these three, four million people camped out there on the border of his country and scared him to death. Scared him to death because he thought, man, they're going to just mop us up. And so he sent to a country nearby where there was a prophet named Balaam, B-A-L-A-A-M, Balaam. And he said to this man, Balaam, I want you to come over to this country, my country, Moab, and see these people that have come out of Egypt, and I want you to curse them. I want you to curse them in the name of God, to curse them so that they will not be able to overflow my country. So Balaam said, well, what are you going to pay me? <laughs> and Balak made it a bargain with Balaam to come curse Israel for a price, for a price. And so Balaam said, build me some altars, and uh, I'll see what God has to say. Well, they did this, I don't know how many times, two, three, at least three times. Because every time that he built altars and said to God, I'd like to curse your people, okay? God said, nothing doing. You ain't cursing my people. And so he'd go back to Balak and he'd say, sorry, I can't do it. Balaam would say, well, do it again. Look out, look, let me take you up on a high mountain. Let me see where you can see all these people. And, took, and he'd say, now, now build you some more altars and you curse them. And they said, okay, I'll build the altars. They said, now, God, can I curse them now? God said, no. At one point, Balaam even got on the donkey and tried to ride through, and he went through a narrow path, and the donkey crushed his foot against the, the wall because he was trying to do the wrong thing. 
But Balak finally decided, you know, if I can't curse these people, and if this prophet can't curse these people, one thing I can do, I can do something that will cause them to have a stumbling block. I will do something to the people of Israel that will cause them to stumble. And he did. And he did. Notice what he did. It says that in verse 14. What was the stumbling block? To eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. So he says, Balak says, I know what I'll do. I'll get the people of Israel to eat meat that is offered to my gods. Oh, it's delicious. Look at this. And he showed it to the Israelites. And so they, oh, and what? So they ate and worshipped false gods by eating meat. Oh, the God didn't get it. He didn't allow Balaam, Balaam to curse them. He didn't allow them to be destroyed. You have some people there. You have some people there in your church. Them, them, underline them. You have some people there, them, who are teaching in your church that it's okay to commit idolatry and that it's okay to marry outside of the Lord. You can marry outside of the Lord and you can eat things and partake of things that are idolatrous, you have people like that teaching that in your church. That was one of his condemnations of the church in Pergamos. Now, First Baptist of Seaford, what do we have to guard against? We have to guard against that very thing. A stumbling block. Something that somebody in the church might be teaching or might be advocating or might be promulgating that is against the teachings of Scripture that would cause us to start looking around and saying, oh, it's okay to do this. Oh, it's okay to do that. It's okay to do this. It's okay to... we got to take a stand. It's okay to marry outside of the Lord. It's okay to start dating unsaved boys, you know, our, our young people. Somebody might say, oh, it's okay to date sin because you might win them to Christ. You better be careful. <coughs> Many a young girl has started dating an unsaved boy, fell in love and married him and lived a life of hell because that unsaved person never got right with God. And am I talking to anybody who knows what I'm talking about here? So we have to be careful that our teaching does not include the doctrine of Balaam. <coughs> the doctrine of Balaam that caused the people of Israel to have a stumbling block and to commit fornication and to eat things offered to idols. What's another thing they condemned in verse 15? What did Jesus also condemn in verse 15? The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, Nicolaitan means the word triumphant or victorious. Victorious over the laity. Nicolaity. What is the laity in the church? What is the laity? It's us. We're the laity. Layman. You ever heard of layman? The word layman? The layman in the church is just the members of the church. And Nicolaitan, victorious over the laity. 
victorious over the laity. Well, what would that mean? What would that mean? Well, wouldn't it mean that somebody set themselves up as somebody who was above, above the layman, above the layman? Now, who could that be? A priest, a pope, a bishop, a pastor. Yes, there are pastors who set themselves up over the laity. And people are scared to death. Did you know that in the Roman Catholic Church, the greatest fear that a layman can have is that the priest would refuse to forgive their sin and they would suffer excommunication? They're scared to death. So this, now, what does God say about this Nicolaitanism in verse number 15? You have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. I hate. I don't want anybody lifting themselves up over the people. I don't want anybody lifting themselves up as the high gyrosecutus. Everybody is on the same level. It's all level ground at the foot of the cross. The pastor and the people are at the same level. Nobody's above anybody else. No Sunday school teacher, no deacon, no trustee. Nobody is over anybody else. We're all on the same level. Because I hate that thing, says God. I hate that thing, says Jesus. Now, the other thing, that the, another doctrine of the Nicolaitans, another doctrine of the Nicolaitans was to eat things offered to idols and to have freedom of the flesh. Oh, it doesn't really matter what you do. If it feels good, Steve, What's the rest of it? Do it. Do it. <laughs> if it feels good, do it. That was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Well, you know, there are churches today that say, it's okay. You can do this. You can do that. Just go to confession. Go to confession, say so many Hail Marys. Do so much of this, so much penance. And as a result, you're forgiven. It doesn't really matter uh, what you do in the flesh because the flesh, the flesh is the flesh. You know, if it feels good, do it. God says, I hate that. I hate that. That doctrine of the Nicolaitans, I hate. All right, now, so he can commends, he condemns, and then he, com he commands. Verse 16, he commends, he condemns. What is the command of Jesus in verse 16? Repent. Repent. <laughs> Repent. Repent means get back to what? Get back to the basics. Get back to the fundamentals. Get back to where you were. Get back to where you ought to be. So the application for us here at First Baptist would be make sure we are emphasizing the fundamentals, the fundamentals, the basic things, the doctrine of salvation through grace, the doctrine of salvation through faith, the doctrine of the shed blood of Jesus Christ as that which cleanses sin. Those basic things we need to get back to and this church Pergamus needed to get back to them. Now, we have then, we have the commendation, we have the condemnation, we have the command, and finally, we have the warning, verse 16. What is the warning in verse 16? If you don't repent, what? I will come to you quickly, and I will fight against, what's that four-letter word? Them. That's why I had you, he's not fighting against the whole church because he says, you're right, you're holding my name fast, you're keeping the faith, but there are people in your church that are teaching false doctrine. You're people in your church that are advising you to do wrong things. 
There are people in your church that are wanting to compromise, and against them, I'm going to come quickly. I'm going to come quickly against them, and I'm going to what? Fight against them with the what? The two-edged sword. There's going to be some vengeance. There's going to be some punishment. There's going to be some judgment against those people who are doing the wrong things in your church. So, does the pastor have to do that? Do I have to do that as a Sunday school teacher? Do you, as a, a member of the laity, do any of us, as a member of the laity, have to go out and fight against those things? No. We'll let Jesus do it. Amen? Amen. We'll let Jesus do it. You know, there are lots of problems that are created sometimes because people try to make the corrections when Jesus is the one who will do the correcting. I pastored for a lot of years, and I saw this happen over and over again, where somebody would get out of sorts, and they'd start teaching false doctrine in the church, and pretty soon, they were out. They were out. I didn't kick them out or throw them out, but they left. They went out from us. What does it say? What's the scripture say in first John, second John? They went out from us because they were not of us, but they went out that it might be manifested that they were not of us. Jesus will clean them out, and he'll take care of it. He did. He's already done it in this church. We've had people leave, and goodbye, good riddance, because they were not of us. So he will cut, cut with the two-edged sword. And I don't want that, and you don't want that, so let's, I tell you what, I tell you what, let me give you a piece of advice. Let's stay right with God. Amen? Let's be sure that we're right with God, and that won't be happening to us. Now, finally, I got two minutes to do this. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. That's the rest of the church. The church is doing the right things. If you will be an overcomer, and First John tells us overcomers are those that believe in Jesus, so we're all overcomers if we believe in Jesus, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. What is this hidden manna? What was manna? It was this wonderful food that God gave Israel in the wilderness. You remember that? And what did they do with that food after it ceased? God said to Moses, I want you to take a golden pot and fill it with manna and put it where? In the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant was Aaron's rod that budded and the Ten Commandments and this golden pot full of manna, hidden manna, hidden inside the Ark of the Covenant. And so God says to the church in Pergamos, you people that are to get right with God and staying right with God, I'm going to give you to eat of angel food. I'm going to give you to eat of the secret, the secret manna, the hidden manna that's in that Ark of the Covenant. You're going to get a special diet from me. You're going to get a special, wonderful, nutritious, spiritual diet that's going to strengthen you because you have stayed right with God. Isn't that wonderful? And then the last thing he says is, I'm going to give you a white stone with a name in it carved into that stone that nobody knows but you and me. What a wonderful promise to Jesus for those of us who stay right with God. I'm going to give you a stone and a name in it that only you and I know. You talk about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I know and he knows, but nobody else knows the name by which I am known to him. Oh, how wonderful. How wonderful to have that kind of personal relationship with Jesus. So these people who stayed right with God in Pergamos were promised, were promised two wonderful blessings, hidden manna and a white stone with a personal name in it. So, now we're ready for Thyatira. Next Sunday, read the verses beginning in verse 18. 
down through the end of God's message to the church in Thyatira.